So we're going to do a little bit of practice this session um, related to what we were just talking about, this idea of the lower tantras. And then within the lower tantras, there's yoga with sign, yoga without sign. We're going to look into yoga with sign, that uh, self-generation through the six deities. So if you've ever done a Numne, it's going to be familiar. Um, it'll be excerpts from the Numne Sadhana. But even if you've never done it before, I think as written, it's fairly clear if you just kind of experiment and just kind of do what I say or what is written from the sadhana and just be like, all right, let's see what happens if I do that. And, you know, just gently, gently kind of play with it and see how it goes for you. And then if you're having questions pop up, just kind of keep them somewhere in the back of your mind and we can talk about it afterwards. So we're going to do a little um, quick vocab just so I don't lose anybody in the practice and then we'll jump into the practice. So just to review, um, all four classes of Tantra practice the four complete purities which can be summarized as the practice of deity yoga or taking the result as the path. We haven't gone into that in a ton of detail, we just kind of outlined these four. So the first three Kriya Tantra, Charya Tantra, Yoga Tantra. These are the quote, external Tantras that emphasize yoga with sign and yoga without sign. Then there's highest Yoga Tantra, which is considered the internal Tantra, which emphasize generation stage and completion stage. So we're looking at lower Tantras. And so this yoga with sign is deity meditation that engages relative appearance either through visualizing one's body, speech, and mind as a divine speech and mind, or visualizing oneself as inseparable from the nature of the deity generated in the space in front, depending on if you have the empowerment. So then various visualizations are accompanied by verbal mantra recitation and or mental recitation, as well as vase breathing. And so vase breathing is kind of the next step once you get used to nine round breathing that we did. And through all of this, one achieves calm abiding. Then yoga without sign is deity meditation that engages in the non-inherent existence of the deity. It is meditation on the emptiness of the divine body and is also referred to as the concentration that bestows liberation at the end of sound, which is so many words to say we're basically meditating on emptiness. And it follows the yoga with, with sign meditations. So we talked about the four branch repetition. We haven't yet talked about abiding in fire and abiding in sound. So through these practices, one achieves the union of, of shine, calm abiding and special insight focused perceptually on emptiness. So when we're doing the first one, deity with sign, then the self-generation is built up through these six steps. So um, the deity of emptiness, deity of sound, deity of letter, deity of form, deity of mudra, and deity of syllable. And so before we go into these in detail in the practice, um, we just need a little bit of background vocab. These are probably fairly clear, some of them or half of them, but just to make sure, we've got in a sadhana something called a commitment being. And the commitment being is just the main deity of the visualization, whether the self or the front. So we're doing Chenrezig practice, the commitment being is Chenrezig. Then the wisdom being are the actual deities who are invited to merge with the commitment being. So first you're building a visualization, right? You're going through this process and you think, okay, eventually there's Chen Rezig. He has however many arms, four arms, thousand arms, whatever. He's radiant white made of transparent light, et cetera, et cetera. You visualize, but then you invite the Buddhas from all 10 directions to merge with what you visualized. And those are called the wisdom beings. And then mantra is probably clear, a sequence of sacred sounds and related symbols of the deity or that which protects the mind. And then the seed syllable is the essence of the deity and mantra as one sound and syllable. 
So these words will get sprinkled through the sadhana, so I didn't want to lose anybody. Um, so in the form of letters or syllables that represent the sound is just a little note there. Okay, so commitment being the main deity, the wisdom beings are all the other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the same aspect as the main deity you're practicing. So you're practicing Chenrezig, you think all the Buddhas take the form of Chenrezig, and then they dissolve into the main one that you visualized. Yeah, and then the mantra gets arranged in a garland or like in a circle that's standing upright and in the center of it is the seed syllable. So the wisdom beings dissolve into the commitment being and the mantra gets arranged in this fashion. It looks flat but we visualize it three-dimensionally. So after the wisdom beings dissolve into the commitment being, the mantra with the seed syllable are focused on at the heart of the deity, whether the deity in front or ourselves as the deity, that's where the mantra garland goes. And sometimes you're gonna hear also this addition, a concentration being, it's usually just the seed syllable of the deity, which is focused on as a focal object for some shine or calm abiding med meditations, like Hri in the Chenrezig practice, so if you see the concentration being, you think, well, what's this now? It's just the seed syllable. And it's called the concentration being because you're really sharpening and making simple and specific um, what you're focusing on in that section of the sadhana. So here's the summary. And this is from Principles of Buddhist Tantra by Kurti Senta Rinpoche. Um, he says, in action tantra, self-generation is accomplished by relying on the six deities. The empty deity, the sound deity, the letter deity, the form deity, the seal or mudra deity, and the sign deity. This crucial statement implies that when practitioners, especially beginners, engage in such practice, they need an external aid. For example, when an old man tries to lift himself up from a chair, he relies partly on the arm of the chair and partly on the support of a cane. So too, the self-generation is achieved partly through the mental effort of the practitioner and partly through the words of the ritual that guides the practitioner through the practice of the six deities. For success in this practice, you need to rely on texts that clearly describe the gradual transformation from first to the sixth deity. So we'll do that. And just to kind of give a really quick overview before we meditate, the deity of emptiness, you just think all is empty of inherent existence. Deity of sound, from emptiness, the sound of the deity's mantra resounds. Deity of letter, the sound of the mantra takes the form of letters and syllables. Deity of form, the mantra form transforms into the deity's body. Deity of mudra or seal, the places of the body are blessed via mudra, etc. And the deity of symbol or sign, we meditate on divine pride if we have the empowerment or aspiration if we don't, and clear appearance. So that's gonna be all listed in the sadhana itself. And what we're going to do is um, a lightly abridged and edited example um, from the Nungne Sadhana. So if you're wanting to look at this next to the full Sadhana, it's in the FPMT Foundation store um, for a PDF download. It's probably free or a couple dollars. So the page numbers up at the corner will correspond to the PDF from the FPMT store. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and start and do the practice. You can read along with me, or if that you find that is too distracting, you can close your eyes and just listen. But some people find it easier to concentrate if they're reciting along. Your choice. So get yourself into a good posture. Nice straight back. And think this is just an experiment, something to play, something to connect with. And by doing this practice, may my own compassion and wisdom 
increase and develop and radiate out and become a catalyst for the wisdom and compassion in others to develop as well. And in doing Tantra, may I always remember the three principal aspects of the path. Renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara. Bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. And the correct view, the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. And we start with the request to the lineage lamas. The heavens of the Dharmakaya are supreme, yet out of warmth, a hundred thousand moisture bearing clouds of non referential compassion gather. I make requests to Padmapani, skilled in sending a rainfall of attainments of benefit and bliss to limitless migrators. Excellent Bhikshuni Lakshmi, gone to the stage of supreme liberation. Chandra Kumara, who favored the five sciences. Jana Bhadra, sublimely strong in patience, effort, and faith. I make requests to you three friends of my graders. Please bless me to renounce all the perfections of cyclic existence, to be unattached to the bliss of my own peace, and to generate the supreme mind desiring to liberate mothers equal to space from the ocean of suffering. Please bless me to eliminate ordinary appearance and grasping with the clear appearance and divine pride of the six deities. The deity of thusness, the tone of the mantra's empty resonance, the seed syllable, the form complete with smarks and exemplifications, the commitment mudra and sign. Please bless me to accomplish each and every common attainment through dependence on the concentration with four branched repetition and to complete perfect concentration with the yogas of absorption in fire and sound. Please bless me to uproot the two obscurations with the great space-like concentration, bestowing immaculate liberation that destroys all trust and grasping at signs and by being endowed with a mass of merits of skill and means. And then the instantaneous generation. If you have the empowerment, think, I instantaneously arise as the holy body of the great compassionate one. And if you don't have the empowerment, think, instantaneously arises the holy body of the great compassionate one at the crown of my head, performing the following actions on my behalf. So you as Chenrezig or Chenrezig above your crown, Stabilize. Om Padma Tatri Hum Pei Om Sawa Shuddha Sawa Dhamma Sawa Shuddha Hum. The offering substances become just empty. From within emptiness, from broom syllables, Vast and extensive precious vessels arise. Within each, the syllable Om melts into light, from which arise drinking water, water for the feet, flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, food, and music. Empty in nature, they have the aspect of the individual types of offerings and function to bestow special uncontaminated bliss. Om Hagyama Hum, Om Padyama Hum, Om Pupeya Hum, Om Dupeya Hum, Om Halukeya Hum, Om Gandeya Hum, Om Nudeya Hum, Om Shatta Hum. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my collections of generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all migrating beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my collections of generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all migrating beings. 
I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my collections of generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all migrating beings. Rays of light emanate from the right white Hri that rests on the moon disk at the heart of oneself, visualized as the great compassionate one. Invoking from the natural abode, Guru Arya, great compassionate one, having the aspect of 11 faces, surrounded by the root and lineage gurus, the assembly of deities of the great compassionate one, and an assembly of meditational deities, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Dakas and Dakinis, Dharma protectors and guardians, all abiding in the space before me on a wide stem thousand petal lotus. And so whether you're able to visualize or not, have the strong sense that all the gurus, root and lineage, and all the deities are present, bearing witness to your practice and supporting you. To all those worthy of veneration, with bodies and numerous as all the atoms of the realm, I prostrate in every way, bowing with supreme faith. Om Maya Lokeshwari Sapariwari Agyam Padyam Pupe Dupe Aloke Gande New Day Shapta Pratisa Soha Whatever negative actions I have done, with my body, speech, and mind, under the control of attachment, aversion, and ignorance, I confess them all. Having a mind of regret, honesty, transparency, able to see our own faults as faults without overly identifying. Imagining that the compassionate mind sees all of these faults with perfect kindness and wisdom. I rejoice in all positive potential of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in 10 directions, of solitary realizers here still training and those beyond, and of all transmigratory beings. And so rejoicing in our own positive actions, those of our peers and the people that we know, as well as all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and all of our teachers. You who are the bright lights of world in 10 directions, who have attained a Buddha's omniscience through the stages of awakening, all you who are my guides, please turn the supreme wheel of Dharma. Imagine offering a giant Dharma chakra to the Guru deity who happily accepts. With palms together, I earnestly request you who may actualize para-nirvana, please stay with us for eons numberless as atoms of the world, for the happiness and well-being of all wanderers in samsara. Imagine offering a giant lion throne with a cross double George on each face to the guru deity, who happily sits and abides and agrees. Whatever slight virtue I have accumulated by prostrating, offering, and confessing, 
rejoicing, urging, and requesting, I dedicate it all to full awakening. The deities of the field of collecting merit return to their own abodes. Om Salawa Shura Saladama Salawa Shura Ham. The natures of myself, the deity to be meditated upon, and all phenomena are an essence of one taste in emptiness. From the sphere of emptiness, the aspect of the tone of the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum resounds, pervading the realm of space. My mind in the aspect of the undifferentiable suchness of myself and the deity becomes a moon mandala upon which the very aspect of the tone of the mantra resounding in space is set down, having the form of written syllables like very pure mercury adhering to grains of gold. that completely transforms into a thousand petal lotus, as brilliant as refined gold, marked at the center by the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. From the tips of multicolored light rays emitted from the moon, lotus, and mantra, innumerable holy bodies of the Arya Avalokiteshvara spread out, pervading all the realms of space. Great clouds of miraculously emanated offerings are beautifully offered to the Buddhas and their children. From yet another great emanated cloud, a continuous rain of nectar descends, extinguishing the fires of suffering of all migrators of the hells and other realms. They are satisfied with bliss and become Avalokiteshvara, Shinrezik. Then the light rays, along with the bodies of the deity, return and enter into one's own mind in the aspect of the moon mandala, lotus, and mantra garland. These transform into a multicolored lotus and moon seat upon which oneself arises as Arya Avalokiteshvara, with a white colored body in the prime of youth and radiating rays of light. Of the 11 faces, the root face is white, the right green and the left red. Above that, the central face is green, the right red 
and the left white. Above that, the central face is red, the right white, and the left green. They also have long, narrow eyes and smiling expressions. Above these is a wrathful black face with bared fangs and wrathful wrinkles, a third eye and orange hair standing upright. On the crown is a peaceful red face with a crown protrusion, having a chaste aspect devoid of ornaments and with its own neck. The first two hands are folded at the heart and hold a jewel. The second right hand holds a rosary. The third eliminates the hunger and thirst of the hungry ghosts by sending down a stream of nectar from the mudra of granting sublime realizations. And the fourth holds a wheel. The second left hand holds a golden lotus with a stem. The third holds a water vessel and the fourth holds a bow and arrow. The remaining 992 hands, as soft as lotus petals, are in the mudra of granting sublime realizations. In the palm of every hand is an eye. The hands do not extend above the crown protrusion, nor below the knees. An antelope skin covers the left breast and there is a lower garment of fine cloth. Chenrezig is endowed with a golden belt adorned with jewels and beautified with locks of orange hair. There's a jeweled crown, earrings, necklace, armlets, bracelets, and anklets, garments of various colored silks and radiates rays of white light. At the crown of the central head is a white om. At the throat, a red ah. And at the heart, a blue hum. Upon a moon mandala at the heart is a white hri. Om pema boy so ha. Om pema boy so ha. Om Pema Boy So Ha Om Pema Boy So Ha Om Pema Boy So Ha Light rays radiate from the free of the heart, invoking from their natural abode Arya Avlokiteshvara, surrounded by the entire assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Om Maya Lokeshvara Sapari Ori Vaja Samaya Zaza Zaza Ho. They become non dual with the commitment being. Again, light rays radiate from the Hriya Chenrezig's heart, invoking the empowering deities the five Buddha families with Amitabha as their principal, together with their retinue. Om Penja Kula Sapari Wari Aigyam Padyam Pure Pei Dua Pei Aloke Gande Nua Dei Chapta Pratisa Soha All Tathagatas, please bestow the empowerment upon me. Requested thus the goddess dressed in white and the others who are emitted from the Tathagata's hearts, hold aloft vases filled with nectar and say, just as the gods offered a bath at the time of the Buddha's birth, so too do I offer a bath with pure water of the gods. Having focused upon oneself clearly visualized as the holy body of the deity, then meditate undistractedly upon it is called the deity of sign. So if you have the empowerment, now stabilize divine pride and clear appearance. If you don't have the empowerment, stabilize on the deity in front 
and develop clear appearance and strong aspiration. Everything made of light, transparent light, radiating light. As many details as you can hold without the mind becoming tight. Even just a general sense of whiteness. And then we make offerings. Om Padma Hum Pe. Om Sa Shuddha Saladama Sa Shuddha Ham. The offering substances become just empty. From within emptiness, from broom syllables, vast and extensive precious vessels arise. Within each, the syllable Om melts into light, from which arise drinking water, water for the feet flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, food, and music. Empty in nature, they have the aspect of the individual types of offerings and function to bestow special uncontaminated bliss. Om Padyama Hum, Om Padyama Hum, Om Pupaya Hum, Om Dupaya Hum, Om Haukaya Hum, Om Gandaya Hum, Om Nudaya Hum, Om Shapta Hum. Om Maya Lokeshwara Sapare Vareya Gyam Padyam Pupe Duape Aloke Gande Nude Shapta Pratisa Soha. On a moon disk at one's heart, or Chen Rezig's front-generated heart, is the concentration being the syllable Hri, surrounded by garlands of the mantra to be recited, white in color and standing clockwise. Light rays radiate from them, filling all the inside of one's body and purifying all negativities and obscurations. Light rays radiate outwards, from which an incalculable assembly of deities of the great compassionate one are emitted, purifying the negativities and obscurations of all sentient beings and setting them in the state of Arya Avlokiteshvara. These then collect back and dissolve into the Hri at one's heart. So holding that visualization, we add the mantra. Taking a minute to stabilize what the visualization looks like. Picturing yourself at the center, able to see all the syllables simultaneously. The syllables actually remaining static, stable, but you have a 360 degree view of them. Light radiates out and collects back. Om Mani Padme Hum, 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 Om Mani and may whom oh, money pen 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 may whom 
Continue the mantra under your breath together with the visualization. Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. Money, pen, and then purifying any mistakes or omissions. Um, Pemisapa Samaya, Manu Palaya, Pemisapa Tena Padishta, Tito Mibo, Sudokaya Meboa, Supokaya Mibo, Mano Rakta Meboa, Sawa Sidi, Me Prayatsa, Sawa Kama Sitsame, Sidam Shriam Kuru, Hum Ha Ho Bago, Sawa Tata Gata Padma Mame Mutsa Padma Bawa Mahasamaya Sapa Ah Hum Pe. Om Pamasava Samaya Manapalaya Pamasava Tena Padishna Dira Mibawa Sukaya Mibawa Sukaya Mibawa Hanarakta Mibo Sama Siddhi May Pratha Sama Kama Sitsame Sinam Shrim Kurum Ha Ho Bhagavan Sama Tata Kata Padma Mami Mutsa Padma Bawa Masamaya Sapa Om Pe Om Pamasava Samaya Manapalaya Pamasava Tena Padina Dira Mibawa Sukaya Mibawa Sukaya Mibawa Hanarakta Mibawa Sama Siddhi May Pratha Sama Kama Sitsame Sinam Shrim Kurum Ha Ho Bhagavan Sama Tata Kata Padma Mami Mutsa Om Sawa Shura Sawa Dhamma Sawa Shura Hum. The mandala becomes just empty. From within emptiness, a white room radiating five colored light rays separates from the syllable Hri at the heart and comes to rest the side of the mandala. It transforms into a multicolored lotus on which rests a multicolored cross vajra. Upon its central hub is the inestimable mansion composed of a variety of jewels. It is square with four doors and four archways. In the middle of that is an eight petaled lotus at the center of which is a precious throne upon which are a variegated lotus and moon. On each of the petals of the four directions is a moon seat Upon the central cushion is a white syllable Hri, which becomes a white eight-petaled lotus as brilliant as refined gold and marked by the syllable Hri. Light rays radiate from it, making offerings to the Arya beings and enacting the welfare of all sentient beings. They collect back and from their transformation arises Arya Avalokiteshvara with a white colored body in the prime of youth and radiating rays of light. In the east from Broom, blue Akshobhya, right hand pressing the earth, left in equipoise. In the south from Tram, yellow Ratnasambhava, right hand giving the sublime, left in equipoise. In the west, from Om, white Virachana, with the mudra of supreme enlightenment. In the north, from Ah, green Amoga city, right hand giving refuge, left in the mudra of equipoise. 
They are all also beautified with precious ornaments and garments of various silks and seated with their legs in the Vajra posture. Upon a lotus and moon disk at the heart of the principal deity is the white hri from which light rays radiate, invoking from the Patala in the southern direction, Arya Avalokiteshvara surrounded by an entire assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the 10 directions. Protector of all beings without exception, divine destroyer of the intractable legions of Mara, perfect knower of all things, Bhagawan and retinue, please come here. Om Harya Lokeshvara Sapare Vare Vajra Samaya Zaza Zaza Ho. They become non dual with the commitment being. The crowns of all the deities are marked by a white Om, their throats by a red Ah, their hearts by a blue Hum. Again, light rays radiate from the Hri at the central deity's heart invoking the empowering deities, the five Buddha families, with Amitabha as their principal, together with their retinues. Om Penchakula Sapariwari Aigyam Padyam Pyurpe Duurpe Aloke Gande Nude Shabda Pratisa Soha. All Tathagatas, please bestow the empowerment upon him. Hum Sawatatagata Bishakata Samaya Shri Hum. They bestow the empowerment. Thereby the entire body is filled and all defilements are purified. From a transformation of the excess water remaining on the crown, the head becomes adorned with Amitabha on the crown, Akshobi on the forehead, Ratnasambhava behind the right ear, Varachana at the back, and Amogasiddhi behind the left ear. Om Haya Lokeshwari Sapare Vare Yagyam Padyam Pua Pe Dua Pe Aloke Gande Nude Shabda Pradisa Soha. Your thousand arms are a thousand wheel turning kings. Your thousand eyes are the excellent eons, thousand Buddhas. I prostrate and offer praise to the Venerable Avalokiteshvara who shows whatever is needed to subdue those to be subdued. Although the Dharmakaya is inseparable like space, your form bodies are separately visible like rainbows. I prostrate and offer praise to the five families gone to bliss who have attained mastery over method and wisdom. The exalted wisdom beings of the self-generation dissolve into the front generation. Due to these virtuous actions of mine, may I quickly become a Buddha in this world. May I give Dharma teachings in order to benefit my greaters. And may I quickly free sentient beings who are tormented by many sufferings. In all my rebirths, may I belong to a good family, be clear in mind and free of pride. Have great compassion, respect for my gurus and abide in the pledges of Avalokiteshvara. O Avalokiteshvara, whatever your body, your retinue, lifespan, realm and so forth, Whatever your supreme and excellent name, may I and others become only like that. So that's um, from the Numne Sadhana, which some of you know. And it's just a really good way to understand the way the six deities go, because it's a Sadhana that actually explicitly lists them. They're actually theoretically embedded in all Kriya Tantra practices, just not explicitly outlined in that way. So you can do that with any of your Kriya Tantra practices, just substitute the visualization for the correct one and the mantra for the correct one there. So when you're doing these practices, I think one of the main things to do on your own is to give yourself a chance to connect. So each section, you can just read it and feel connected at a pretty quick pace. But if it's new, you might need to kind of push pause and just stop there and think, what is it to connect with the lineage gurus? You know, and then you get to the invocation part. What does that mean that what you visualized and what is already there have now merged? What's the implication of that? What is that all about? Just kind of let yourself be with the truth of each step and also to ask questions about each step if you're feeling a little bit unclear. I think even just something as simple as 
inviting the deities or invoking the deities is odd to us if we think about it. And then it becomes very deep once you've thought about it a bit, because you think, why am I inviting them? They're already here, <laughs> right? Where, you know, um, do they need to be invited? Aren't there Buddhas on every atom, num numberless as atoms, each surrounded by a retinue of bodhisattvas? I've read the King of Prayers, I know, right? And then you think, but I'm invoking them. What's that about? And it's really for us to feel receptive and open to the presence that's already here. It's, it's inviting us to open rather than calling them from somewhere else. And when we visualize something, like Chenrezig, we're inviting that energy, that archetype, that presence within us to come out and that presence that's outside to support it. But we don't necessarily feel the truth of that unless we feel like there's a merging of the fake with the real, even though it wasn't fake, what you visualized, it helps make it feel truer to invite from outside, even though they're already here, even though they're already with you. So there's just a lot of that in Tantra where you're merging with things that are already here, you're inviting things that are already here, and it's a mental exercise for you to open and to feel the connection. Yeah, and also to kind of acknowledge the fact that any space can be a sacred space if you allow it to be, and kind of the ordinariness is something that we bring to places, not something that they have in and of themselves. But what can happen is that when you're inviting sacredness to a space repeatedly, that space holds something. And you can feel it in all religious traditions. And you can also feel when it's absent. You know, going back to my Russia story, I remember one little tiny wooden church where people were doing practice every single day felt like a church or a gompa or a synagogue. It felt like a sacred space. It was just beautiful and warm and rich, just a tiny little wooden church. And then I went into one of the big giant famous ones, felt like a museum. It's like all of the churchness kind of left it over the centuries because it hadn't been actively a church for so long. You know, so it's not the smells and bells and pictures and accoutrement that make it sacred. It's that's what remind us that sacredness is possible here. You know, and that all of these things, it's like, what are you bringing to it? It's wonderful to have a tanka. The tanka invites the deity, but you have to engage with the fact of that for the truth of that to be felt. You know, so these things can't be passive. And again and again in the sadhana, there is that kind of back and forth movement that eventually becomes you merging with the deity, becomes you merging with the guru deity. Then what is the guru? And what is the deity? And how are they separate? And how are they not separate? Becomes a really important conversation because in the beginning, we have kind of a, a parental or a spousal or a therapist sort of a transference to the human being who was our first teacher or the series of human beings that were our first teachers. And there's something important about that step of a real flesh and blood person who inspired you on the path, who represents the qualities you wanna develop. And who they actually are is something we will not know until we have higher levels of attainment. We can only guess. We cannot take another person's measure. Right? We can try and we can assess, make sure they've got stable ethics in terms of behavior. We can look at that. Yeah, stable ethics in terms of behavior. We can observe that. We can ask around. We can check and should check. But really what you're looking for is, does this person speak to your wisdom? Do they wake up your wisdom? Because there's a lot of perfect teachers out there. There's actually tons. It feels like they're so rare, but they're actually a lot. We're really, really lucky. You just have to be a bit proactive and find them and take Dharma holidays rather than regular holidays and budget properly, you know, and kind of prioritize your resources. But there's a lot of good teachers out there. But are they a good teacher for you? Means do they speak to your wisdom? And you almost feel like, they almost sound like the elevated version of you. Like they're saying things you almost remembered or things that you recently forgot. There's some sort of resonance between you. And it's not as simple as the same learning style or the same personality or the same sense of humor, but it can feel like shades of that. There's something in common, you know, and it's a karmic thing. So 
if you're finding someone speaks to your wisdom, that's a relationship worth cultivating. But at the end of the day, what you're really cultivating is your inner guru's ability to hear wisdom more and more widely. You just started with this relationship to kind of get you warmed up. Yeah, so they got you warmed up and now you're expanding and expanding and expanding it. And then the inner guru and the outer guru become like one eventually. And, you know, there's some of my teachers who have passed away and I almost feel like my relationship with them is closer because I've more integrated what it was they were resonating with. Yeah. And after a while, the personality and the human interactions become less and less necessary to cultivate depth. But in the beginning, it's nice if they put a kata over your head and it's nice if they pat your cheek. It's nice and we're humans and we need that kind of connection. But at the end of the day, you don't really need it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you stay in that kind of like parental therapisty transference mode, you keep yourself a child in the Dharma and you don't mature as a Dharma student. And so, you, you know, take those relationships with your gurus, but eventually recognize the fact that they were speaking to your wisdom, which means your wisdom was already there. Now you're just perking up, you know, and opening its receptor sites and helping it listen more deeply. Does that make sense? You know, the famous prayer, you know, uh, calling the guru from afar, one of the final verses is something like, bless me to meet the ultimate definitive Lama, the bare face of my own mind with the coverings of true existence and perceiving them as true removed. So the human guru is not to be underestimated. They're the gateway to so much, but don't think the gateway is the path. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's hard to talk about the guru because it goes beyond words, even though, you know, in the Lam Rim, you can read tons and then Lama Songkhapa's commentary on Tantra, you can read tons. And then there's all of this kind of like heavy stuff about what it means to break a relationship with the guru. And it all gets kind of like, you know, you get nervous or you worry it's culty or it feels like, you know, it can get kind of a funny feeling. Yeah. And then you realize what's being said is that if you discard the the connection it makes it harder for you to trust your ability to hear wisdom right so even if your teacher shows aspects of you know behaviors that you yourself would not do and you think are unethical it's your own wisdom that's able to even notice that so you're able to still hold this inner guru that knows better they might have even been the one that taught you better and now they're doing the wrong thing and you're like, haha, is this a test? You don't know, right? And you can say that behavior is wrong. Guess why? Uh, worldly wisdom, common sense, also the Dharma, right? You can say these things, but you're framing them in terms of an observable behavior. You're not attributing motive because you don't know the motivation. But you can 100% say, these series of behaviors go against Dharma and the worldly wisdom says that when they happen, here are the practical solutions. However, the very reason why you did them might be that we need policy change <laughs> or the very reason you, we, they did them is that there's some purification you're assisting me with. There's a million reasons which could be perfect reasons or not, but I can't know that. And if I've made that decision that you are one of my teachers, I'm choosing to see you in the higher light because I don't want to destroy that feeling of a pathway or a connection to hearing my own wisdom more deeply. So that's for people you've already chosen as a teacher and chosen as a tantric teacher specifically. If it's a sutra teacher, it's much more akin to mentorship and seeing them as a representative of the Buddha. You know, it's layers of relationship. So when we're taking tantric empowerments, we do have to remember we're also taking people as a tantric teacher, which is a much deeper karmic relationship than just taking refuge or bodhisattva vows from someone. It implies a lot more. The benefit is more, but also the danger is more. So sometimes people think, oh, I've been hanging out for this empowerment. I don't know this Rinpoche, but I want that empowerment. So I'm just going to take it because I want that empowerment. And then later you find out that Rinpoche is a bit like dodgy in their behavior. It really disturbs your mind. Yeah. So you want to do good checking. Yes. Don't jump in. 
Yes, remember Lama Tsongkhapa, check 12 years. We don't have 12 years, death is coming, but please wait longer than 12 hours. Please, more than 12 hours, <laughs> please. Okay, so at the end of the day, what you're really looking for when you're having this guru deity thing is that you imagine that the teacherness, whatever the teacherness or the guruness or the lama ness that you've been able to access your whole life since you were a tiny kid, you know, where you were able to have someone else's wisdom resonate with your wisdom, takes the shape of the particular deity that you're practicing. Yeah. So that teacher ness, which almost becomes like a fusion of every moment of teaching you've ever had in your life in a way. Yeah, like you might not even like your kindergarten teacher, but if they effectively taught you the alphabet and it was very useful, you know, there's part of that teacherness comes into the whole field. Yeah. Or, you know, your mother taught you colors and shapes and, you know, she was one of your teachers. Take that into the thing, even if your relationship with her is otherwise complex. Right. You know, you just kind of taking what is that dynamic that over the years has woken up my wisdom. All of that is the guru deity. And in this practice, it will take the shape of Chen Rezig because I'm emphasizing compassionate wisdom. But that exact same energy can then manifest as Tara when I'm wanting to engage and emphasize with swift action and protection. So it's, it's like the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is like the ocean, all with separate little water molecules, but you don't really notice the separate water molecules because it's all just the ocean, yeah? And then when you're doing a deity practice, the ocean kind of takes the shape of this wave or that wave for a specific purpose, but it's all just water. Does that make sense? Yeah. So out of emptiness, this arises and then dissolves back into emptiness. Sometimes it's helpful to think of it in terms of the ocean because the, I guess, <laughs> the non-affirming negation of emptiness makes it hard to picture for obvious reasons. So sometimes it can help to put it into oceanic terms. Do you have any thoughts or questions before we call it a day? I'm just interested in the back visualization of the actual symbols. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned that it was okay to visualize it in the way that you would read it, possibly. So mm -hmm. maybe in our alphabet, is that okay? Because that would be much totally more, okay. so much easier. Yep. Um, what you're wanting is um, shapes that represent sounds. So the sounds you cannot change, they're sacred sounds, but the shapes that represent those sounds can be in any language that is your preferred language. So if you want them in English characters or Mandarin characters or whatever, it doesn't matter. Thank you. Yep. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, so I had a question to do with the um, the um, mantra circling mm. and it appeared to be anti-clockwise and, you know, I'm, I'm not getting hung up in it, but I just thought that was interesting because I'm more used to, whenever I'm visualising, for me, most of the stuff's going clockwise. I mean, obviously it depends, you know, if you've got your Sanskrit vowels and consonants and dependent arising mantra, then they sort of do different things. So can you just clarify that aspect? To do with yeah, it? yeah. And I'm not sure if I have my Zoom um, photo mirrored or if I've done something weird, but it is. it should go clockwise, but the right. syllables are facing inward. Right, okay. Right, so the syllables are facing inward during the mantra recitation time. They're static, they're not moving. I have them moving so that you have a sense of how mm -hmm. you can see them all at the same time. Yeah, but yeah. they're static and then light out, light in, light out, light in. Yeah, so they do go, um, they stand clockwise. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. great. Um, and sorry, I, another no, quick no. question to do with the um, commitment being I think for me that sort of clarified that because I think I've always been a bit confused um in terms of the stack beings probably because of the Avalok, um his holiness visualized yeah. holiness Avalokiteshvara and I was thinking well hang on a minute the commitment being is that is that his holiness is that Avalokiteshvara and how does that relate to me arising as Avalokiteshvara. So I think, and I think in that practice, it's clear, but then when you're doing different sadhanas, yeah. Then, so yeah, so that's helped. So that's us arising um, in the appearance of the main deity. 
it's it the commitment being is basically the main deity that you're visualizing sometimes it's self generation sometimes it's front generation but it's the visualization that you're building up and then you're inviting wisdom beings to merge with yep yep so yeah <laughs> front or self depending on context but the main one yeah max go ahead yeah i mean uh, first of all yeah I'm I really, uh, I really admire and like your presentation. It's, it's just straight and conversational and really just kind of simply co everyday conversation wise, which is refreshing. And I think the way I like to receive teachings on, on, on Tantra and Dharma, it's like you have a cup of tea and we're just giving you something there in that conversation. And that really just kind of normalizes everything. I really like that. I really must appreciate that. And also what the way, the way you talk about Sadhana, it reminds me, um, I used to write a lot of plays and I write like film scripts and so the, the play or the film script is not the play it's just yeah. a play as well so I'll think about it in that way yeah okay. yeah um, no I like that analogy that's that, that's a very good one and I think about how I actually fill out the skeleton aspect of it and make it make it performable yeah yeah, yeah. exactly um so yeah that's it so thank you yeah, it's, that's a good one. The, the same play can be dry as dirt or the most profound thing that's ever happened. Yeah, and yeah. I, work with, I work with some great dramaturges, some absolutely really inspiring dramaturges. And I work with some people who haven't got a clue what's going on and they try to put, they try to put on plays and it's terrible. But certain dramaturges are just brilliant because you understand people's energy, forms of expression, gesture, all that, and how to use space, how to charge space. And so there's a huge yeah. difference. And I think about that kind of formative theory. Yeah, that's a good people. one. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Well, tomorrow we're going to do um, a bit on the five Buddha families because I think it's interesting and useful and then kind of pivot to how that ties into empowerments and what happens in empowerments. I can't go into tons, but the things that are a bit more open and accessible about empowerments and how that goes with the five Buddha families. But um, I'm also up for um, requests so if there are things that you want to cover or are curious about um have them primed and ready so we'll go ahead and dedicate john chu sam jorim bo she ma ke panam ke yu chi ke ba nyam ba me ba hiya go ne gon du kawa sho toni da wa rim bo she ma ke panam ke yu chi Ke pa nyam pa me pa hi, go ne gon du pa Thanks, folks. See you tomorrow. <laughs>